Hello and welcome to Eye on Oakland. I'm Chuck Moss. I'm your host coming here from the magic of Zoom. Uh, and I think it's StreamYard this time. All these applications, you know, but it's the same thing. We're glad to be here. We have a great guest, Colleen Zamet, who's newly elected board member from the Birmingham Public Schools and School Board. But welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, congratulations. I was uh, saying a hard fought campaign. Um, how'd you, how did you do it? Well, I thought I knew what I was getting into going into this. I talked to other people that had run for things. Uh, I certainly knew what the political climate was, but it was just more than I thought. So thankfully, my family was really supportive. My husband, he ended up being my speechwriter, my my chief strategist, my top advisor. Uh, my kids, they helped me canvas. They unfortunately had to put up with a lot of late dinners, with a lot of takeout dinners, a uh, very messy house. Um, and a very distracted mom for a while. So they're they're ready to get some things back to normal. Well, good. I know that with my daughters, the one thing that they uh, said uh, in public is no parades. We'd have them in parades and they were like, oh, dad, this is just so lame. I, one daughter has this little tiny dachshund and everybody loved it. And as we're going down the road, the street, she, can you make her paw wave? And, no, yeah. So no parades. But other than that, you know, they, they were, it worked out. Uh, so you ran on two issues, uh, at least from your website, and I got a couple more I like to ask about, but the parental rights and fiscal responsibility, let's take the last one first. Uh, fiscal re responsibility, um, like a lot of Birmingham, I, I live in Birmingham, I'm a taxpayer and a citizen, I was shocked to learn about the huge deficit. So um, I guess what happened, how did it happen, who's responsible, and how do we keep it from happening again? Well, I'll kind of start backwards. How do we keep it from happening again? We really just have to have a lot of eyes on that budget, always going through it with a fine tooth comb and not being willing. We can't be willing to pass a deficit budget anymore. We typically do that. Now, I will say this. We are embarking on facilities review and we'll see what it tells us. We've been losing students for at least the past 10 years. Of course, we lost a huge number of students during COVID. Some are coming back, many of them aren't, but we'll probably have to make some pretty hard decisions in the district. Um, as for who, who's responsible, I think there's just a lot of responsibility to go around. Um, you know, unfortunately, when we passed that initial budget, it did not take into account the drastic decline in our enrollment, or at least it assumed all those kids would come back, and of course they didn't. And then after it was initially passed and it was already a deficit budget, um, we, we gave raises to all our teachers. Now we need to give raises. Of course, we need to keep our teachers happy. We need to keep them living, but when we're already in a deficit and we're already facing massive declines, I don't know that it was the right time to do that. And it certainly contributed to the huge budget deficit. And unfortunately it contributed to the layoffs that happened at the end of the last school year. Well, when you say you know, we passed, uh, you weren't on the board at that time. Well, that's so, true. I say we, the board, the board. Yeah, did. The board. Yeah. You, that, that's, you ran against that. Um, you say you pass a deficit budget. Yeah, that seems to typically happen. And then they, of course, make amendments to the budget to close up that deficit. Um, I would like to see that we don't do that anymore. Just, I would, uh, you know, deficits, I, I, don't pass it. Uh, you know, I, I, um, did finance at Oakland County. I was chair of finance at Oakland. I was chair of the House Appropriations Committee in Lansing. And a deficit budget, I used, I mean, guy, yeah. that's probably something you should not do. I mean, it's, no. you have a budget to begin with and have stuff happen, okay. Right. But to start with a deficit, I mean, that's, yeah. that sounds um, peculiar. Well, it's just, it, it's not appropriate at all, but we've been running on a structural deficit for years. I mean, we simply have we have too many expenses and we have too little revenue and we've got to make some long-term changes. So that's what I'm hoping that facilities review will really help us with. Well, good. You need to right size. And that's, uh, that's, yeah. that is an unfortunate thing. It's not 1950 anymore. What, uh, get, uh, but okay. You mentioned, I was going to wait to get into it, but you jumped on it first is post COVID. Uh, news is coming out now about the effects of the COVID. And I want to say, so not so much the, pandemic, but the lockdowns. Uh, what has been the effect of lockdowns in the, that you've seen in, in the Birmingham public schools? That you made. Um, I don't like when people mischaracterize it as the effects of the pandemic. It's the effects of our response to the pandemic. 
So first the kids were out of school. Uh, then, you know, they started, they were just locked out of school completely. Um, we did pivot into virtual learning. And I think that everybody did the best they could in the spring of 2020. We made the unfortunate, very last minute decision to start the 2021 school, oh, no, no, excuse me, fall of 2020 virtually instead of hybrid. And I think that was pretty devastating on our kids. And then eventually we went into a hybrid situation. And of course, eventually we got the kids back to school, but with many restrictions. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing the impacts that were predicted by a lot of us. Test scores went down, obviously. We've got more kids getting referred for uh, things like speech therapy. Um, and it was also predictable. So we also have a lot of behavioral problems that I'm hearing about and just a lot of I don't want to say this. Well, there's a big there's a big focus now on kids' um, mental health. I think being out of school the way they were, and then coming back in such a fearful environment, I think that affected them obviously. And you add that to the pressures of already being a teenager or a tween, and having this pressure to succeed in school, and we just didn't serve our kids well. Well, it's a you know I, I hate to blow it off as a learning experience, but. Uh... You know, decisions were made and they were made and um, OK, but moving forward, I guess the question is now remediation. You have a whole cohort, uh, two or three years of people that were um, that have been damaged. Let's be honest. They, they were damaged by the lockdowns of the policy. How do you catch them up? How do you remediate this damage so they're not a lost generation? Well, we're really talking about some targeted interventions. So there's definitely, and of course, we received a lot of uh, COVID money, ESSER funds. Um, we definitely are going to be providing tutoring, more tutoring, more after school programs, more really targeted interventions to the kids that suffered the most. Um, I do want to make sure that we focus on all of the kids that maybe they didn't even appear to suffer. Maybe their grades are mm, okay. Maybe their test scores declined just a little bit. They still need help too. But we do have a lot of kids who who had a much harder time and we're really going to be getting in there, giving them the help that they need. I haven't seen the details yet. I don't know if we've got all the details worked out, but um, that's one of the reasons I'm really happy to be on the board now or well in January so I can get more details and hopefully get them fast and have a voice in, in, in how this all works. I would think that remediation of the COVID uh, damage, and let's call it that, the lockdown damage, uh, would be a, a, a high priority or number one priority is to say, look, you know, what can we, we've got to bring this generation back. We have to, I don't say reclaim a lost generation, that's overstating it, but we have to, this, this generation has been damaged, this uh, cohort, and we're going to bring them back. I would think that that alone is, uh, that's a, a real great, you know, uh, Marshall Plan, Moonshot, whatever you want to call it, that would be a great priority. Yeah, I do think it needs to be our number one priority. I did a lot of uh, candidate profiles for different publications. So, you know, the newspapers, the local newspapers, bigger newspapers, magazines, they send you all these questions. Oh, and, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, one of them, I think the question was, what, what, what do you think the board or the district should be focus on, focusing on coming out of the pandemic or what should the top three areas be? I, I think my response was something to the effect of repair the learning loss, make that the first, second and third priority. We have to get these kids caught up. And we're really fortunate that we live in a district where a lot of our kids have the support that they need at home. Um, plenty don't, but a lot of them do. And so we have to tap into that parental support, that neighborhood support and really build on what we have here. And I, I think we can do it. It's just gonna take a lot of work over the next few years. Well, there's a ton of money or there has been a ton of money available. Uh, you know, economically, we could talk about the effects of that. But uh, the question is, is, that, uh, is there any district anywhere in the country that would be a model that they said, OK, we're going to have a crash program to remediate the COVID damage and we're going to have extra classes. We're going to have enrichment. We're going to just assume everybody needs to be brought back up to a level. Is there anybody doing this anywhere that uh, the model? I'm lazy. I like to I like to follow established models people have already done. You know, names are escaping me right now, but I have seen some reports of a couple of districts in the country that really seem to be um, ahead of the curve. And so I need to do my homework and 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 find out you know, what those districts are, why I can't remember their names right now. I don't know why. And reach out, reach out to school board members there, to administration there and say, hey, 
what have you done already? How fast did you move on it? How did you decide to move so fast? And then see if we can model what seems to be working or at least give ourselves some new ideas. I'm I'm with you. I mean, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. I think we've got a lot. I think we've got a lot, a lot of talent to work with in our administration, but that shouldn't preclude us from just going out and asking for help. Oh, yeah. See, I, I hate to invent the wheel. That's whenever, you know, that, that was one thing I always would, would do is that, look, if it's being done well somewhere else, go find out what they're doing and how they did it. You know, and so most people are happy to talk about it. You know, they'll brag about it. So good. Well, that's, you know, if you can be, you know, Colleen remediation, for want of a better word, uh, I think that that sounds like a great thing. And, and I'm glad you're you're on it. But uh, before, you know, we're going to we're going to run out of time for this before the break. But I would like to go back to the uh, fiscal responsibility. Um, we may be headed into or I think we're already in essentially a recession or recessionary times. Uh, that means real estate slowdown and that means lower housing values and that means less property tax revenue. And those of us who went through 08 and all that um, is the BPS, Birmingham Public Schools, ready for the impact of possibly recessionary uh, lowering of property tax revenue? Well, I have How's your not- budgets, you can tell. <laughs> I have not. Um, I have a, a day long uh, meeting set up with members of the administration, and I'll be talking to our finance director about that, among other things. But um, she's good, and I know she's got to be thinking about it already. I will say this when she joined us, months ago or possibly a year ago, I remember distinctly one of the things she said in that meeting was that we don't have a revenue problem here in Birmingham. We have the revenue to do whatever we want to do. What was left unsaid was that means we have a priorities problem. So of course we have to be thinking about the decline in um, property taxes. And so how are we going to adjust our budget to get ready for it? Given what we just went through, how hard our administration worked to cut costs and really go through things line by line. I feel like they've they've really already started the process. And so now being on the board, I want to go through that with them and really understand everything in our budget, what needs to stay, what could go, what could be adjusted, because we have to prepare. We have to prepare for a reduction in our funding. It, it's going to happen. I don't think many people will dispute that. Uh, it's it's funny. It's uh, it's like I feel like you know, well, young 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 Padawan back in the winter of 08, 09, when <laughs> uh, you know two can set one can, one quarter we had the uh, you know the property values drop twenty percent, and the quarter after that it dropped twenty five percent, and everybody had been saying up till then, oh no, houses in Birmingham always hold their value. Well, no. So uh, you know once burned twice shy uh, as far as recessionary uh, revenue drops, uh, just. Uh, that's my question. Like I said, I do budgets. What do you want? You know? No, I, you're very smart to ask these questions now. And that's, that's the best thing we can be doing is to be planning in advance. We have to, we have to meet these things head on and be well prepared. Otherwise we're going to get caught again in a, and have a bad budget. And the worst thing that can happen is we end up having to do more layoffs. I don't see that happening, but that is the worst thing because then not only have we have we impacted these 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 teachers and staff's life who, who we've let go, we're impacting the students. And I know we can prevent that going forward. Yeah, well, that's good because, you know, it, uh, staff is staff is the huge amount. I mean, I think isn't like labor, like 90 percent of your budget. Oh, uh, yeah, it's a huge. It's huge. I uh, well, remember that. All right. Well, we're going to take a break here. We're talking with Colleen Zamet, who's newly elected to the Birmingham Public School Board. I'm Chuck Moss, and don't go away. We'll be right back here on Eye on Oakland. If you love them enough to relearn math so you can teach them math, then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're correctly buckled in the back seat. Welcome back to Eye on Oakland. I'm Chuck Moss. I'm your host. We're coming, uh, zooming in, uh, and we have a great guest, Colleen Zamet, newly elected board member at the Birmingham Public School Board. And it's always great to get fresh blood, new eyes in on things. And uh, well, congratulations on being elected and uh, looking forward to uh, looking forward to have you on. Um, we were talking about you know budgets and things. Let's take a break here. I want to ask you something. Um, delicate question here. Um, I know one of our other local school districts uh, um, used to be one of the best in the state. They call themselves a lighthouse district, and now they have slipped their ratings. They're mediocre. Uh, 
has Birmingham got a maybe an issue that it needs to uh, maybe spiff itself up to get back to where it was, or is it still the lighthouse district? Well, we're not ranked number one in the state, and I think we should always strive for that. I think we have the talent here to get there. Um, you used to be. We used to be. We just haven't been for a while. Now, we just, and we've publicized this one a lot, Niche.com just came out with their 22, 23 rankings, and they ranked us number five. Now, all of these ranking sites take different factors into account. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt. But that was good that we went up in the rankings. I checked some other ones. And of course, I left my notes in the other room. Uh, I think US News and World Report were, I don't know, somewhere down in the teens, maybe. Um, there's another couple of ranking sites that put us maybe around eight. So it's important to understand why certain districts around us, I know no, Nova is ranked higher, Troy is ranked higher. Um, why are they ranked higher? Um, Troy is ranked higher. Troy is ranked higher than us. Oh, that's, oh, come on. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, like so. Ohio State. <laughs> I know. But that was a great game on Saturday. I'm Michigan it was. And as a Spartan, I want to say congratulations to the University of Michigan. Well done. We did well. It was exciting. So we just, we, I mean, it all goes back to the academics, right? We need to put academic achievement at the core of what we do. What else are we here for? We are here to provide a rigorous academic education to our kids. We expect a lot of them. And if we do that, the kids are going to succeed beyond what they think is possible. I mean, I've got three kids. They're very different. Their success for each one of them is going to look different. But as long as they've worked their hardest and have done more than they think they could do, then that's success right there. And we need to push every kid in the district that way. And we need to present them with the most rigorous curricula that we can we can get. I like curricula, not curriculums. Uh, question. Uh, Aren't they? I mean, uh, Birmingham has always had this reputation of being, you know, the top. And, and, uh, and uh, are they not being pushed with academic rigor right now? Or is some, you know? Well, I didn't grow up here, admittedly. My husband did, but we have been in this district with our kids since 2009 when our oldest started high school. And it does seem like Birmingham is like most of the rest of the country. I feel like we've been eroding standards for our kids. We're not expecting as much from them. And I think we can expect more. Um, I will say that we are in the process of piloting two new math curriculum curricula for our K through eight programs. And when we started the process a year ago, we put out requests for proposals. We got a bunch of proposals. We weeded out certain things right away. I mean, I wasn't obviously involved in that, but we looked to other districts in the state that were similar to us in socioeconomic status. I put a question out there that why didn't we look to districts that outperformed us around the whole country and see what they were using? And still, I don't have an answer for that. I think we need to be looking at the best and see what we can get for our kids to challenge them. I just want to make sure we're doing that. I think I think generally we're providing them with a very rigorous curriculum, but I think we can probably do better. And we need to stop the carryover um, from the COVID area of letting kids retake, retake, retake tests and quizzes and redo homework to get the uh, to get the grades that they want to get, and and really. Uh, challenge them a little bit more so that they're used to that when they exit our doors. Well, I, you know, I didn't uh, grow up in Birmingham either. I grew up in, in Midland and, uh, you know, Dow Chemical, the math and science was quite good. And in fact, the competition, I mean, you try competing in a classroom with the son of the guy who invented saran wrap, which actually <laughs> uh, and, awesome. you know, the guy who has the guy who holds who helped build the patent for, um, you know, other things. So, uh, yeah. Um, so I believe me, you know, uh, English, it wasn't quite so, I mean, it was good, but you know, there weren't so many, it wasn't like being at the, you know, in the, the headquarters of random house. So, uh, I think that making yourself, uh, compete with the best around the country is a better way to uh, raise the bar. 
Uh, one one of your uh, one of your things that you've been uh, after, you know, I mean, accepting the mediocrity or taking it over and over. I wish I could have taken things over and over again. And I remember the, taking the bar exam, and boy, it was that. Yes, you could take it over again after you failed. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, what uh, you also have as a uh, other one of your the keys of your campaign was was uh, uh, parental rights. And what do you mean by that? So what I mean by parental rights is, is having a real system in place, a very collaborative board so that parents, A, are comfortable coming to the administration or the board with concerns of theirs. And I don't think a lot of parents are right now. And really working with parents and hearing what they have to say and having our elected board, our seven member governance team, be responsive to the needs of the community. I don't think that's happening quite enough right now. I feel like the board is deferring too much of their authority to the administration they hire. So I would like to get that balance of authority back. Um, I don't want people to misunderstand because some do, and I think sometimes it's deliberate. I don't mean that parents should be able to march into a classroom and micromanage how a teacher teaches or call the teacher or the principal of their school up and say, you better give my Jimmy an A or I don't like the way things are running, you better change it. That's obviously not how it can work. That would be complete and utter chaos. I don't think anybody in their right mind wants that. But if we have a board that is actually responsive to the desires of the community and we run our school district accordingly, we're gonna get these kids back that have fled uh, to the private and parochial schools. I just know it. Now, what what is the proper role of parents in the Birmingham public school system? Now, I'll be honest, but my mother w was a teacher. Uh, she's 94, still doing great. But if there was ever any communication between the school and my parents, I was going to get my butt kicked. I just, you know, because of what I, you know, let's face it, uh, you know, that was the last thing I wanted was for my my parents to call the teachers because then they'd say what I was doing. Uh, you know, and, and if, if there was any issue at school, I was the one that was going to get in trouble. So, and, you know, uh, the idea of calling the, calling the school up and saying that, you know, gee, my little Chuck deserves a better grade. <laughs> you better, you better. Uh, so what is the proper role of parents in the BPS system? Right. That's that's funny that you say so. I'm, my kids by now are so sick of me every year saying the same thing. When you're in a teacher's classroom, the teacher's the boss. You don't like it, deal with it. They always know they can come to me and my husband if there's some kind of serious problem, of course. But basically, teacher's class, teacher's rules. Everybody runs their classroom differently. So the way we do it in our house is obviously we're supportive to our kids. We certainly help them when they need help, but we also encourage them to take their own issues to the teacher. If they're unsure sure of how to do something, if they're uncertain of a rule, if they don't like something, go talk to your teacher. Um, so, so what's happening now is that we've seen this, what's the best way to say it? We've seen in public education in the whole country, not, it's not unique to our school district, that a lot of things are coming into our schools that parents frankly weren't even aware of. And now that they had a chance to be at home seeing what's really going on in the classroom, a lot of them said, oh, wow, this is how things are running. I'm not sure that I really like how things are running. I'm not sure um, I like the direction of our educational system. I want to get a little more involved. And so that's why we've seen a lot of contention in board meetings around the country and sometimes even here. Um, is parents just feel like they have they have put a lot of trust in their elected board to to run the school district how it should be run and some things have gone awry over the years and we just kind of want to right the ship we want to know that when we send our kids off to school every day that obviously they're going to be safe and that they're going to be learning. Um, some really rigorous academics. So they're well prepared. When they walk out of there at the end of 12th grade, they can be contributing members of society. So whether or not they work, uh, go to a technical school, go to a four year university, that they are prepared to go out there and be contributing members of society. That's what we expect. That's pretty much all we expect. And I feel like we just need to get back to those basics of education. 
Uh, now, I know that the you know, one of the, the buzzwords is whether you call it anti-racism or CRT or that it's an ideology. Uh, is Birmingham, is that, is that become a thing in Birmingham? I hear it's a thing everywhere. Well, it is a thing everywhere. And yeah, it, it is here in, in some ways. Um, obviously, there's no class CRT 100. Um, but the tenets of it are here in our schools. So, you know, you've got critical theory, which really seeks to change society versus classical theory, which seeks to understand and uncover truths. Um, so when we put, you know, race or gender into that critical theory, we're, you know, critical race theory means viewing everything through a lens of racial inequity. And so we begin to look at any disparity as signs of implicit bias or systemic racism. And I do not think that's appropriate to be putting on our kids. Uh, we had, it was optional. It was an optional um, book club reading the summer before my daughter started high school, but I decided to give it a try with her. Um, it was a book by Ibram Kendi called, this book is anti-racist. Uh, I think that's Ibram Kendi. Called. Oh yes. Ibram Kendi, yes. And so it was obviously a take on his other book, how to be an anti-racist. And I do have a lot of problems with this term anti-racist. It is not simply the lack of being racist. It is affirmatively being racist to a different end. I have a real problem with that. And also in the first few pages of this book, I had to laugh with my teenage daughter because she was labeled as both an oppressor because she is white and oppressed because she is female. That's laughable. And we need to go ahead and laugh it right out of our school system because this is not something that we should be putting on our kids. It's damaging. Well, a, when I was, in, you know, once again in high school or early high school, there was a guy, uh, in Martin Luther King, and we, we embraced what he said. And mm -hmm. uh, God did not make us any real different. And, uh, and he died when I was in ninth grade. I never forgot, you know, we never forgot it. And now we have Martin Luther King Day. So now moving, just moving, we'll, we're going to have to wrap up here. We're going to have one more minute. You have two things you can get done very quickly in 25 words or less. What would you do? Magic oh, one. Boy. Well, learn everything I can learn about the role and responsibility of board members and the board itself and seek to integrate into this governing body to really bring back governing our school district to serve the interests of our community. That does it. See, it's amazing what people, that's great. Those are good. Um, well, I wish you luck. I, I know that the school, the school board is tough. I am, um, uh, when my daughters were little, uh, somebody asked me to uh, wanted me to do it, and I got the advice, and now it'd be easier and easier and less hassle to just go run for state representative. I said, <laughs> "Okay, um, I'm still." But uh, so you have you have uh, my admiration and good luck, uh, Colleen Zamet, who is a newly elected board member of the Birmingham Public Schools. Thank you for joining us, and and good luck and remeeting the COVID the COVID uh, problem is a. I think it's another noble priority. Thank you for joining us. And thank all of you for joining us here on Ion Oakland.